Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Reimagine 2020, the Halloween edition. Tales from the Crypto is th this month's theme. Uh, it's right for uh, October, you know, the month of October. Um, this is our fourth event within the Reimagine series of conferences. I'll be your host today, Adam Leone, with, with the Mouse Bell team. Um, if you've missed any of our past three events, feel free to visit the Reimagine 2020 website. You can find that at ri2020.io for full access to over 150 interviews from some of your favorite projects and individuals in the space. Um, our main goal ultimately is to talk shop uh, with some of the top projects in the world, uh, some of these industry leaders um, to shed light and help us understand blockchain's real impact and innovation, um, advancements towards web 3.0 and decentralized future and, and our decentralized infrastructure for the future. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'm excited to have uh, Justin Rice, head of ecosystem from Stellar. Um, it, super interesting conversation. The first time around back in May, feel free to go to the Reimagine, you know, 2020 uh, YouTube channel and look up Justin Rice. Super cool. Um, so again, Justin, thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking time out of your day to, to come here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, I mean, we've had you on before, so I don't really need to go down that path, but I do want to highlight kind of the concept that, that you brought up during that discussion back in, in May, um, just about kind of the independent artists in like blockchain, right? And I think that's kind of a cool concept of, of doing it yourself, really D DIY and, and figuring out the path. Um, and there's a lot of similarities of, of blockchain and be, you know, be, being a, a independent artist, which that's kind of where you came from, right? And I think it's important to note that blockchain is still trying to figure itself out trying to instead of getting um maybe listeners now we're trying to get users right and an and adoption and in, in same kind of marketing guerrilla tactics of of pushing out instead of you know out of the back of your trunk a cd we're pushing out like a software a technology right to kind of leverage and, and build upon so i i think those are those are kind of some some cool some cool ideas and i don't want to go on too much longer but you know can you give us some updates i guess in the last i don't know six months, there's been a lot going on, but I think to kind of narrow it down here, um, uh, give me one second here. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, just some feedbacks. I know there's been an explosion of partnerships. You know, you guys have a stellar community fund and, and I'll kind of, we'll go down this path throughout the, throughout the discussion, but first and foremost, like, um, yeah, give, give us some updates on what you, what you've been working on lately for, you know, the last few months. Sure. Uh, over the last few months, the Stellar ecosystem has really grown a lot. And part of that has to do with just organic growth, more people coming and finding the platform, figuring out ways to use it, building cool things. Part of it also has to do with partnerships that the Stellar Development Foundation, which is really the nonprofit organization that stewards the Stellar network. But we're out there also trying to find people um, and work with people to help them integrate onto Stellar and to use the network to, to great effect, right? So we've also had a lot of great um, partnerships that have come together over the past quarter. Um, and a lot of those have to do with anchors. Um, anchors on Stellar are basically what we call the organizations that accept uh, deposits of fiat currency and issue credits on the network. So they're sort of the on-ramp for the network. And for the sort of Stellar vision uh, of the world, there will be the goal is to get anchors in all these different markets because the network itself, you know, is is asset agnostic. It can represent any currency. So, the idea is you get all these anchors who represent different fiat currencies on the network, and because the network has built-in order books, you can easily exchange those. It makes it really good not just for like currency exchange, but also for things like cross-border payments. So we work a lot on getting um, more anchors onto the network, um, and some of the big ones are. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, yeah, that, that that's interesting. Like, which is kind of one of my questions actually down the road, and and you're touching on it. It's like, what type of what type of assets are you guys focused on? There, there's tons of fiat. Are you also looking at like other cryptocurrencies or like stocks? You know, other types of uh, assets that uh, from from the traditional world. You know, is there any kind of focus or priority from from an acre standpoint? Yeah, the the first priority for the organization SDF Stellar Development Foundation, I'll just probably call it SDF from now on for brevity. Um, the SDF's focus primarily at this point is on fiat currencies. Um, so you know we have we work with 
anchors, a, a lot of them, we have a U USD anchor and we just announced a new partnership with USDC. So USDC is gonna be issued on Stellar. Um, we have a Euro anchor and then we have a lot of anchors in, in Africa and Latin America. Um, and the first priority is to get those fiat currencies uh, represented on the network because they're good on off ramps and because they connect to people in their real lives, right? If you have a digital version of a currency that you can spend in your normal life, it's a lot more useful. And we're definitely focused on practical real world use cases. However, there are also some really cool projects on Stellar that deal in other currencies or that issue other currencies. Um, the first I'll mention is called DSTOK, D S T O Q. Um, DSTOK essentially represents uh, stocks on, on, on the Stellar network. Uh, so you, it's, it's an app that you can use and you can basically access and trade um, digital representations of stocks, you know, Tesla stocks, Google stocks, Apple stocks. And it's cool because they also partner with some of these fiat on ramps so that it gives access to those stocks and the ability to trade them to people in, in markets where it's not necessarily easy to get access to those stocks, right? So in, in Nigeria, where you can use the Nigerian Naira uh, anchor that we have to on-ramp that company called Kauri, you can then like sort of deposit that money into an account with DStock and trade stocks. So there's also stock trading. Um, and then finally, you, you asked about other cryptos. Yeah, there are, um, you know, Stellar operates well with any payment rail, including other crypto, um, other blockchains, because you can create a digital representation of Bitcoin or Ether, just as you can of dollars or Nigerian Naira or Apple stock. So we have some pretty talk, solid anchors that basically you can hold a stellarized version of that asset and you can redeem it by deposit, giving it back to the anchor who will give you that value on the other chain. So yeah, there are also cryptos, other cryptos represented for sure. And when you talk about anchors, you say you have one, you know, in the US, you know, in Africa in certain certain regions, what does that mean? Is it like one anchor, a, a bunch of anchors set up? Um, yeah, I, I guess it's, sort of misleading. <laughs> it's kind of misleading for me to say we have like what, what that really means is that there are businesses who are building on the network that offer these on off ramps. There are anchors that have chosen to build a business. Um, and as part of that business, they offer like sort of the, the, the rail or the connection between the local currency and the stellar network. Uh, in general, most markets, we don't have multiple anchors, but like in most markets, there's one primary anchor, you know, so I was talking about Africa. Um, so for example, in Africa, there's an anchor, there's a company called Kauri that uh, issues a Nigerian Naira token. Um, there's also a company called Click Pesa that's going to issue Tanzanian shillings and Kenyan shillings and Rwandan francs. And there's a, a company called Flutterwave um, that's going to issue a uh, West African franc. So in each of those uh, regions, each of those markets, there's just one anchor. Um, in the US, there's more than one US dollar anchor. But so while it is possible that there could be multiple anchors at the moment, it's more like in each region, there's primarily just one at the moment. And what's that process like? So, you know, obviously there's people trying to understand blockchain in general, trying to separate blockchain and crypto, trying to separate Bitcoin, and then, you know, various currencies. And, and I think to highlight Stellar's payments, right? The effective of payments and rails and, and cross-border um, transactions. When we talk about these anchors, uh, and let's use the, um, in Nigeria, like let's use one of those anchors. What, what's that process like? So for, for the average user, uh, they're on their mobile phone um, and they, they um, the on-ramp from their, their local currency and they purchase, uh, you know, Stellar Loop, like XLM or like, what, what's the process? What's the flow? How does it look like? Yeah, it's actually an interesting example that you chose. Kauri, which is the company that issues the NGN asset, the Nigerian Naira asset. They, they actually have two different use cases, two sort of different business models. The first is really business to business payments. And they have essentially set up a, a payment corridor where on the one hand, they um, sort of represent uh, companies in Nigeria that have Naira. And when they need to make payments to Europe, they Calry interacts with a Euro anchor called Tempo and they have a payment rail. So essentially a business can come to Calry and make a payment that goes over the Stellar network. And because it's using Stellar, it's fast and it's cheap and it's free and it's, there's a lot of visibility, right? There's not these long settlement times that would, if they were using a traditional banking rails that relied on SWIFT would take a long time and would be fairly opaque. 
um, they use Stellar, they use Cowrie and Cowrie is using Stellar. The company doesn't actually even know that it's using the Stellar network, right? So for them, Cowrie is just a, a sort of business to business payment platform. So they would just go to Cowrie and they'd say, we need to pay our provider or, you know, in Europe and we need to pay them in euros. Here's some Naira, Cowrie makes a payment. It ends up on the other side sort of magically through the magic of the Stellar network where their client gets euros in their bank account. And that's the B2B rails. On the other hand, there's also consumer facing um, deposit and withdrawal of Stellar assets that Cowrie also does. And what's cool about that is that there are these standards for interoperability that uh, surround Stellar. They're not at the protocol level. They're basically standards for building um, APIs on top of the protocol. And anchors and wallets both follow these same standards. And so what that means is that Cowrie sets up basically a set of APIs that any Stellar wallet can interact with to allow users to deposit and withdraw fiat from Cowrie. So that means that the typical user experience is they choose their wallet of choice. One popular Stellar wallet is called Lobster. So a, a, a user in Nigeria picks up their Lobster wallet. They can, within the app itself, deposit Naira into, into, uh, with the anchor, Cowrie. And Cowrie will credit their wallet with Naira um, that they then hold digitally in their Lobster wallet. Now, once they have that, they can make a payment um, to someone else in Naira, or they can make a payment to someone else. They can make a payment to someone in Europe, and it could be transmuted during the payment into euros. So they can send a payment in Naira, and it ends up in the receiver's account in euros. Or they could just buy or sell. Uh, they could just buy XLM. They can buy Bitcoin representation. So from the consumer point of view, with their favorite wallet, they can easily deposit fiat currency beyond the network and then choose what they want to do with the digital version of the asset. And, and why is this important um, in the sense of, let's see, how do I want to pose this question? You know, I think there's a lot of people that are, we're used to what, what we have, let's just call it in the States or maybe developed, developed worlds, uh, countries, uh, markets where, you know, we, we train, we still use a SWIFT system, but I think people, uh, information, the internet can, we can move information like super quick. And I think what you're tackling is why can't we move money that quick, right? It takes, we've just gotten used to using, I, I come from the bank. I used to work in the bank and, and it, there's so many middlemen, they come in on a Monday, we do the wire has to be perfect. I have to like call a bunch of people to figure out why it hasn't been received, right? When the normal standard time is like, I don't know, 24 to Actually, it's like 24 to, I don't know, 72 hours. Could be longer. And I think people underestimate that. And, and you just kind of highlighted so much stuff that's important of, of what you just said, even from the API standpoint of, of your own kind of stellar ecosystem standards that are, are critical to allow these individuals, these entities in other parts of the world transfer value like super quick. And so why is it important for free to have standards. And then I guess, why is it important um, for you guys to tackle this issue for these reasons? And I kind of just touched on some of it, but I'd like to hear from you on, on these payment rails, right? And, and what we take for granted can be quicker. If we can send an email like that fast, we should be able to send money. And we don't because of these legacy systems and there's no, there hasn't been innovation and probably no reason to. They make money billions off of the fees and, and it is what it is. So I think to highlight everything you just said from lobster, from calorie dealing with businesses, I mean, it's complicated to, to put in the, the, Naira, the Naira and then end up in Euro. There's like a lot of things going on there and, it, and you're making it happen within, I don't know, I think, you know, three to five seconds or something like that. You got it. Three to five seconds. That's the average close time for a stellar ledger, which is why three to five seconds. Um, so I touched on it a lot there, but I think, and you can put it in your own words of, of why it's important of everything you just said to, to bring value to, to regions, to people, even in the States to send money. Yeah. I, I so I think you actually just put it all in very well. Yeah. Um, and I, I definitely agree with everything that you said. I think that right now there are a lot of, right now we do expect information to move seamlessly and quickly and for free and for it to be able to get anywhere in the world. Um, but value does not yet move like that. There are a lot of impediments and obstacles and inefficiencies when you try to move value. And you can experience that in a local market, even if you're trying to make payments 
in, in the United States. But where you really start to feel it is if you're trying to make payments across borders and across currencies. And where you really, really start to experience it is when you try to reach into places um, that are not connected directly. So when you get into smaller markets um, that are more distant, say, from one another, then it, becomes it can become incredibly difficult and slow, painful, and expensive to actually move money. And so there are all different reasons that money has to move across borders and across currencies. Businesses need to make payments internationally. Consumers need to make remittance payments. You know, people working abroad need to send money back home. Um, but also, I think there's a whole potential economy of, of places that don't have access to stable value um, or to all of this sort of financial instruments that, that, that parts of the world have access to. By connecting them to a network where all that value is accessible, you actually open up opportunity all over the world. So I think it's a matter of making business better and it's a matter of making life easier. It's a matter of addressing inefficiencies, making things faster, but it's also a matter of opening up opportunity. And that's really important to us. As, as I mentioned, the Stellar Development Foundation, which is what I work for, is a nonprofit and we really shepherd the network. We're mission driven. Our mission is to, you know, increase equitable access to the world's financial infrastructure. And so it's like kind of this belief that we have that you can do things that make business better, but that also make the world better, that serve this need in the world to have better access to financial infrastructure. So it's a super important thing to work on. Um, and it also feels natural because like you said, the internet has connected us to allow information to move. Theoretically, you know, in, in bl blockchain is in, an innovation that allows value to move in the same way. And so now the goal, not just of SDF and not even just of Stellar, but I feel like a blockchain in general is to find a way to get that value out into the entire world to connect us all and make that value movement easy. And then I guess the other thing you asked about was these standards for the ecosystem for Stellar. We which are important, have, which are yeah. important, right? I think Going back to 2017, I mean, Bitcoin's been around a long time. That that's you know, blockchain and Bitcoin. That that's its application. That's its use case. It's a store of value, and, and you know, same kind of concept a little bit, but but it's slower. Different different mechanisms too, consensus and all that. But um, you know, it was kind of the why. I mean, it, it, we're, we're maturing a lot more from the. I think Bitcoin came out in 2020, uh, 2009, eight. Right. And, and there's kind of that evolution and Ethereum came out in like 2014. And then it was kind of the wild, wild west. where Everybody was kind of launching all kinds of tokens and like um, trying to identify like or understand like what the use case is. But but in but in your aspect, like it seems um, like you just mentioned, like putting standards in place is really important. And, and, and your team also focuses on on the resources, the tooling, right, that to to allow developers and, and entrepreneurs and founders to, to spur innovation, like pretty quick, you know, to, to help not only the network, but a lot of the problems, you know, solve a lot of the problems. So can, can you touch on, yeah, the, the, the APIs and, and kind of the standards that you said, it's not for the protocol, but I think the tooling, you know, is very important. The SDKs, um, how things are structured, the infrastructure on, on, on the, application part of it is really critical and a lot of a lot of people have failed stellar has been really successful at at its use case and and we'll get into it later as i mentioned prior to the call like there's other use cases that that i've been talking to your projects about as we mentor them uh, which is interesting we'll talk about that after but yeah talk about the the the, the tooling and the resources you're offering because i think that that i mean helps so much from the developer side on executing like the, the, the ideas that, that you guys have, that the world has and, and streamline that process. Great, sure. I, I mean, Stellar has really sophisticated tooling. Um, it continues to improve. I think it's very developer focused and pretty dang easy to use, right? Um, like on, just to interact with the network itself, we have an API called Horizon. And Horizon has been around since the origin of Stellar, like the Stellar core, the protocol that actually uh, ratifies and keeps track of the ledger has always had a layer on top of it that was a, a really just a REST API that is really well documented and easy to use for developers. And that's what allows you to actually transact on the network. But as you mentioned, um, there, there's also a, a layer above that where basically, you know, I've been talking about these anchors that connect traditional payment rails to accept deposits and honor withdrawals to the Stellar network. 
There's also a layer there where we have defined a set of standards that show people how to connect Stellar to existing Rails. Um, so they're, they're basically open specs that we work on together with people in the ecosystem. And we define a specific way to set up an API and a specific way to set up a client to consume them. And what we've been doing over the last year and even more, more so over the last six months is that in addition to just outlining that spec for interoperability, the SDF has been creating reference implementations. So we have this thing, it's called Polaris. And Polaris is basically a Django reusable app that you, can, that you can use if you're trying to set up this connection, if you're trying to set up one of these interoperability standards and you can basically you know, sort of customize it and deploy it. So like as a developer, it, the tooling is there to actually like build these APIs um, because we've turned it into a sort of generic uh, uniform process. And so what we're finding is that it's just getting easier and easier and faster and faster to not just be able to transact on the network, but also to connect it to existing other financial infrastructure. And for us, that's really, really important, right? We want to make sure that it's fast and easy to develop on Stellar so that you can get to the part where you're you're not just worrying about how to interact or interface with the network. You're actually focusing on like your business and your region and like the interesting problems of acquiring customers or building a great product. And so we definitely try to streamline that process so that you're not just reinventing the wheel every time. No, totally. And I think, and I think a lot of that, you know, um, ties into some of the partnerships, which maybe we'll get into in a little bit, but one of them is um, Abra, like, which is kind of a recent, marriage as of recent, I know you guys invested in them, but, but, but when I was looking into it, like Abra has, you know, the, I think it's uh, lending and borrowing and stuff, but they want to, they want to be their own bank. Right. And, and they're tapping into to Stellar's infrastructure to leverage that. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that, on that uh, partnership or yeah, sure. you know, marriage I, of marriage of, of, of uh, blockchain products and features? Yeah, I, I will say that, uh, like the the Abra announcement is pretty fresh. Um, yeah, the, the the Stellar Development Foundation. We we basically have uh, the lumens that we steward and that we are in the process of like sort of distributing, um, allocating towards certain causes. Uh, we we really are very transparent about how many there are and what they're going towards. And we have a place on our on our website. If you just look up Stellar Mandate, you'll get taken to it. And one of the buckets, right? Is a thing called the Enterprise Fund, and basically we use it. Um, you know, we have a, a dedicated team that focuses on taking that those lumens and investing in companies in in the space um, to like sort of help them grow their products and help them integrate Stellar. And so Avra originally was mostly focused on Bitcoin, but I, and I can't speak for them directly. Yeah. I mean, definitely you'd have to sure. sort of ask them about this. But I think that they realized that there was something that they could do more if they started to explore other options. And so we talked with them for a long time and we figured out that it seemed like a good match, that the, techno the Stellar technology could help them do some of the things that they really wanna do that you've sort of already touched on. Um, and at the moment, again, I, I, we're just in the initial stages yeah. of implementing stuff. And I think that, th that it's gonna impact their product. And there's, they're gonna be rolling out stuff over the next, you know, in the next year, um, maybe even the, I'm not exactly sure when. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think it'll be cool to see how it's happening. But basically, that's what it was. Like, we talked to Abra, realized that they had great potential. Um, they looked at Stellar, realized that it was a good fit for what they wanted to do, and so we sort of like got together and, and made an investment in Abra. And now we're working with them to help them integrate Stellar into their products. And and th th this is at a high level. I'm just asking out of curiosity in the sense of so how would Stellar play into that product? Just transferring of assets amongst various assets within as far as anchors, like as far as other users. And, and we may not have the answers. Again, this just, I think the news came out like 90 days ago, 60 days ago. Yeah, I, I, I don't have the answers as to yeah. how Abra is gonna exactly use Stellar. Um, I can tell you that in general, I think, and this is again, this is not saying that yeah. this is exactly what Abra is gonna do, but I think that in general with products that integrate Stellar that, that aren't, 100% Stellar focus, right? That look at Stellar and they say, okay, we want to we want to look at this technology and we want to fold it into some existing products that we have. A lot of the time it is to take advantage of those on-off ramps because 
you know, as more and more anchors issue assets and, and create these on off ramps in all different markets on Stellar, like I said, if you build things that are interoperable, suddenly every time a new market is accessible via a Stellar anchor, you have access to it. And so there's this sort of limitless possibility for, for scaling growth without adding a ton of extra effort. And it, as the network grows, your, just, your reach grows. And I think that that's appealing because then you can use those Stellar on-off ramps to get people you know, into your, if you, if you have a product that is a, a digital currency focused product, you can get people in any market that are holding some sort of fiat currency in their bank account or even in their hand you can get them to convert it into some version that works on your wallet. So I think it's the on-off ramps that I think a lot of companies find appealing when they consider integrating with Stellar. One, one kind of idea that I've had over a period of time with on-ramps, and we all use the fiat traditional system, is it possible that that could get blocked off for moving fiat to crypto? Once you're in crypto, it's all good. But right. we're all using, you know, we link up our routing, you know, routing number, account number, or or credit card, debit card. Is it possible that that could get shut off and you can't move money? Like, can government do that? Like, that's one I, pain point that I'm like, almost kind of like the miners, right? Where they, they buy all the chips or, you know, now it's kind of centralized in that point. Is there control or can there be an issue with that? Or no? No, I, I believe that, you know, banking is a highly regulated industry it, all across the world and every jurisdiction has different laws and definitely that you know if for instance definitely there are that is a point at which there there could be a block you know you could block access um and by I you say, i don't mean you i mean like a, I, no I mean yeah like a, a bank a, a regular a regulated a, an entity that regulates yeah. banks could could um, and, and I will also say that like for getting on, on these on-ramps, for instance, you generally have to provide KYC information because the anchors, these on-ramps, they comply with local regulations in their jurisdiction. They comply with AML laws and KYC and collect KYC in order to prevent bad things from happening. So yeah, it is a point at which regulation can and will be applied, the on-off ramps. I think you're right. I will say that Visa has their own crypto, crypto, uh, department, blockchain department, and I will say MasterCard as well. And I've and MasterCard's part of with, along with Stellar is part of our blockchain education alliance. Uh, but it's interesting, I, I um, first of all, they have a department, so that's cool. That's yeah. one step to, to being proactive and like, and I don't really think when I've had a discussion with them is they don't really care so much. They wanna make sure that they are part of the game, which is kind of a different model, right? Like that, that's transaction fees still, that's still, you know, using Visa, MasterCard, Discover, whatever, strictly Visa, MasterCard that I've talked to. But um, no, it's interesting points. And I've thought about that, like, what happens if they just, Visa was like, no, you can't transfer to any kind of thing, any kind of crypto product. But I think what's more important to them is the KYC AML, right? And I think sticking to regulations, you can't, maybe that's the way around it is, we're following the laws, therefore you can't restrict this type of business. Um, and then I, I guess I on the flip- but I think that it's even beyond that. I mean, I think that one of the things that we at SDF are doing is that we believe that it's really incumbent on us to go out there and talk to, to uh, regulators and legislators, help them understand um, how, how blockchain works, help them understand how to come up with effective ways to um, regulate it and legislate it, pass laws about it that aren't overly restrictive, but that are sane and keep, keep consumers safe. Um, and I think a lot of that is like, there are ways to do it. And like I said, I think having KYC requirements when you deposit or withdraw fiat um, is, is a great way to do it. And, you know, sort of jibes with existing laws and regulations. So I think a lot of, I think anyone who's working in blockchain or any organization, especially um, like SDF, it's part of our role is to go out there and try to educate and engage with regulators to make sure that, and, and lawmakers, so that, so that we don't end up so that we end up with good, good ideas about how to how to like sort of keep it safe, you know. Exactly, you're not you're not stunting growth or you know shutting down innovation and in, in, in kind of the way of the future. And you touch on a couple key points there. One, education, um, working with regulators, you know, collaborating, sandboxes, and then two, uh, I mean, consumer protection kind of is what another backbone to regulation and law is, is, you know, the average person, you know, making sure that they're protected. 
um, along with KYC AML on the money, you know, the terrorist funding, you know, anti money laundering. So, so it's interesting points. And, and you're right, actually, now that I think about my question, those are components to a successful, um, it, a successful, like, uh, working between fiat and, and crypto, right? And, and to kind of stay on this topic, um, and, and which I just read the other day too, uh, Stellar Lumens will list like USDC um, and kind of along with Ethereum and Algorand, those are kind of some other kind of partnerships. Can you elaborate on, on kind of incorporating and USDC is like, I think part of Circle, kind of leveraging them as an anchor and, and opening up maybe more users and, and um, target markets? Yeah, so um, USDC is is the center consortium, which was founded by um, Circle and Coinbase, uh, and they have you know USDC is is this um, stable, uh, well capitalized, well known um, USD stable coin, and uh, so we just announced last week, uh, very very recently, um, that USDC is going to be available on Stellar by Q1 2021. And so what that means is that there is a, a USD asset issued on Stellar by this organization, um, which I think is just going to be easier and better for developers um, to use. You know, it, it's it's just a super reliable USD anchor. Right, so they, they can incorporate that um, yes. into, into their applications and, and dApps and exactly. various products and features. Nice. Um, and to even stay, to continue staying on kind of the payment rails, at one point, I mean, Stellar has the solid infrastructure. We kind of just touched on it. And at one, and, and also I thought, you know, with this great infrastructure, um, there weren't too many applications being built on top of them, but I think that's kind of changing now. And Mousebell is part of, is one of the, one of your partners or mentors for, for the Stellar Community Fund. And what I've noticed is a lot of the projects are exploring outside of payments, which is which is interesting. I mean, you know, obviously Stellar's payments focused, but a lot of the projects are leveraging the technology. And you mentioned this earlier, it's cheap, it's fast, um, and it, you know, it's reliable, it's secure. So can you can you kind of elaborate on some of the innovation outside of payments? Through the, the the SCF fund um, and, and through this, you know, your accelerator or you know, you're providing grants and stuff. What are you seeing from from these projects? These these new up and coming projects. Yeah, sure. Just just so that everybody knows, the Stellar Community Fund um, is a, a basically one of our. Like I said, we have our mandate that everyone can see, and one of the buckets in the mandate is for developer support. Uh, it's to help grow projects and help new people new to Stellar get started building meaningful things on Stellar. The Stellar Community Fund is based, it's almost like an ongoing hackathon, right? Like it's, there are two different segments of it. A lab fund, which is for really like tinker projects and new ideas and testing new things, experimenting. And then a seed fund, which helps uh, emerging businesses or new businesses like really get started on Stellar. And we give away, um, you know, several times a year. I think at this point it's six times a year. There's, there's a, a, a contest where you can sort of enter a project um, and the Stellar community as a whole votes on the Lumen allocation. So they decide which projects deserve Lumen rewards. And it's, it, it's, it's part of the way that we are accessible to new developers and that we help them grow and that we encourage them. And it's a really interesting um, you know, incubator for innovation, right? So in terms of things that people are building, I mean, I was just thinking about the last Stellar Community Fund um, I mean, there's definitely people who are using Stellar for gaming, for, for uh, handling like uh, gaming tokens, anything that's tokenized in a game. Um, there are people who are using uh, Stellar for uh, data verification. So uh, things like um, no notarizing, you know, stuff like that. There's people who, who, have starting to, who are starting to experiment with building voting systems on Stellar. Um, anything that requires uh, sort of irrefutable, immutable proof that, that a ledger can, that a signature on a ledger can, can sort of stamp. Um, people are building stuff with that. So I'd say those are two different things, like sort of systems that require irrefutable proof, which would be like voting and, and notarizing. And then also anything where there's tokenization. So uh, gaming, I mentioned already stocks, which is outside of 
um, fiat currency. There's also people who are experimenting with real estate investments. Uh, so because you can issue an asset quite re really easily, and that asset can represent anything that you want, it's kind of just like people think about what a tokenized asset could do, what it would mean to be able to sort of irrefutably have it in an account on a ledger and trade it, and then they just start building cool stuff. Have you seen the evolution? So how, how long has the program been going on for? A little while, I think? Um, we So the Stellar Community Fund has been going on. We, we're in basically what is essentially the seventh round of it. It's been going on for okay. a few years. And yeah. before that, it, there was a, a, another program called the Stellar Build Challenge. So I'd say it's been going on for four plus years. Oh, wow. But I will say that we just really re rejiggered it and relaunched it. Um, this spring at the beginning of this quarter I and mean, that's when we created the lab fund which is like uh it, it it's a smaller pool and it goes to more projects but it also is a lot faster um and we do it more often more frequently and the seed fund which is a bigger pool and goes to fewer projects and that's the one that's for like building businesses and so there's always one of these things going on um anyway i'd say that while the stellar community fund or the stellar build challenge has been going on for several years we, we continue to optimize it. And I think where it is right now, it's like in a better, even more supportive place than it's ever been. And it feels pretty new. And like, I, I know I said this, touched on this earlier, but one of the things that I love most about the Stellar Community Fund is that like SDF, we don't decide who, who, who wins these awards. The greater, anyone like the community of Stellar enthusiasts and developers and ecosystem participants, they get to decide, they get to vote. And we actually just set up a new voting system, quadratic voting, um, that is pretty fun to play with. So if you go, uh, the Stellar Community Fund voting round, uh, community voting round starts on Monday and yeah. anyone can go vote. So you should go on Monday and just to see, I mean, you should go because there's 10 projects there that are really cool and you can help decide how, like which one wins Lumen Awards um, or how much they win. But it's also a pretty fun interface, this quadratic voting that allows you to like capture the sentiment. And I won't get into all the details, but if you go play with it, like it's actually super, a super fun voting system to me. No, no, that's cool. I mean, out of those 10 projects, I think we've talked of maybe five or six in the last like seven, 10 days. Oh, one, cool. one thing that, one thing that um, stuck out was they were just so excited. One, two, they had looked at other blockchain protocols and like chosen Stellar. So that I thought that was cool. Three, they say it's easy to use. Um, they really highlight how easy it is actually to integrate and implement into what they wanted to build, and it just made sense. And I think those are like good signs, right? From from other projects leaving other networks, and not to say that they're bad or whatever, but the point is, is Stellar's creating value for for its for its uh, entrepreneurs, for the developers looking to for better options. And, and I think that's important. And, and that's kind of what I heard, cheap, fast, easy to use, and that they were super excited. So um, yeah, out of those 10 projects, we, we talked to a few and, and super excited to see what happens and kind of who comes out, you know, with some of the funding and all that. Um, kind of pleasure to be a part of that process. So that was really cool. Um, yeah. Thanks for talking yeah, to uh, them. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, it's been great. Every, it. Yeah, yeah. All of them were super nice and interesting. And, and that's kind of what made me think about this question was, none of them were payments actually they were all just another type of application and the technology fit them well and you know and, and they were able to implement it like pretty quick so that that's good i like that. that's great yeah i think at sdf we definitely can reason about what we think the network can be used for and as i mentioned we are at the moment focusing on these fiat on off ramps mostly because it seems like that's a great way to get network effects it seems definitely. like that's a great way to be able to have the sort of assets on the network touch people in their real lives. But also Stellar's open participation, self-serve, anyone can come build on it. And, you know, we might not even know what the, the, the sort of like best use case or the best project on Stellar is gonna be. It might come out of nowhere. And it's so yeah. cool to basically have, we for us to like shepherd and steward this fundamental, uh, you know, technology that at the, at the at the network level and have applications at the application level anyone can come build anything and I, you know i'm i'm always wowed and impressed uh, and, and sort of surprised 
by what people can figure out how to do with it. And I think there's just gonna be more of that where I'm like, I had never thought of this application and this is cool. Totally. And I think that's how a lot of things happen. Experimentation, um, resources to, to do that uh, pretty quick, right? POCs, MVPs, you know, how quick can something, can someone stir up, you know, a project over the weekend, you know, stuff like that. Now I was at Meridian, you know, last year in Mexico city, a great conference that stellar hosts. Um, uh, and a lot of kind of the fruition of, of a lot of these programs or what, you know, the partnerships and all that, would you say at that time they announced that they burned half the tokens and you guys hadn't really marketed too much. Would you say like everything's kind of fallen in place over the last 12 months from that decision to burn that? Because it was, you know, excess, um, I, you know, I heard Jed say it was kind of arbitrary to, I forget what the number was, 100, and, 100 plus million lumens, right? And it just wasn't effective, wasn't efficient. And you realized when you put it down on paper, how much you needed um, comfortably to kind of like, and the hardest part is network effects and like community and growth. So from 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 the last 12 months, burning that and using those funds to market, to get out, has, has it been positive, negative? Was it a good decision? It was a great decision. I think that when the network was conceived, th there was no information about what the, the sort of uh, native network token lumens, like there was no real information about what the right amount should be. Um, it's only after years of use and a really sort of reasoning through the like what the network is being used for that that we that it became clear that we could right size the supply and that it would just get rid of this overhang that is was sort of vestigial right um, and I think that that for me in a lot of ways when I think back it's I don't think that 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 decision itself was what changed things. Um, I think that the strategic thinking that went into that decision, yeah. which we really started doing anew, like last year, this new sort of, what is our strategy? What should we do? How should we move forward? How should we, how should we, how can we be more transparent? How can we get the name out there? What are the pillars of the network, you know, that are, are, are of the sort of goals of SDF? Um, I think it was the strategic thinking underlying that decision that has really changed everything because we realized how to right size the supply because we could think about, but, but, but the way that we did that was by thinking about what we needed to do to make the network succeed. So it was like coming up with a strategy for success led to right sizing the supply. And that strategy is continues to power us forward. Incidentally, uh, I got to put the plug in there because you said this happened at Meridian last year. Meridian Come this up. year is coming up. It's virtual. Anyone can join November 16th through November 20th. I know. I wish uh, we could all meet again somewhere, but maybe, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe in the next event. That was a good time. That was, I think, like a three-dayer, uh, very interesting topics, discussions, speakers. Um, and so, the, yeah, the, yeah, plug it in. Uh, virtual uh, Meridian, Stellar Meridian Conference, uh, November 16th. And I'm sure you can go to the website and, and find out more info. Yeah, meridian.stellar.org. Awesome. Um, so we got a few minutes here and kind of close this thing out. But the next thing, you guys just had a recent update, this protocol 15. Um, can, can you touch base on that? It looks like you skipped 14 uh, from some bu uh, bugs and some kind of network you know, issues uh, made you skip to protocol 15 and kind of just give us some insight on that. Sure, yeah. The network right now is running on protocol 13. Um, we developed and implemented protocol 14 but realized uh, after, like, as we were deploying it to the test net, it, is, it hasn't been deployed to the public network yet. But when it was on the test net, as we continued to test it, we realized that there were, there was just um, these two transactions that were a bit buggy that you could submit. No one submitted them, but in testing, we discovered them. And so basically we decided to roll out protocol 15, skipping over 14. It's almost just a semantic difference, How, but, validators, the nodes that run the Stellar Consensus Protocol and keep track of the ledger, they all tell each other what version of the protocol they're running. Um, and they basically will only talk to people who are running the same or to other validators that are running the same version of the protocol. And so we just wanted to make sure that no one was still running a buggy version of the protocol. Um, and so we're going to upgrade the network to 15. So all those validators say, 
you're running 15, right? So nobody's running an earlier version of 14 that still has the bug. So it's a way of just like making sure that that bug never actually touches the network. Um, so protocol 15 in many ways is protocol 14 with this one fix. And what protocol 15 has it is are two new features to, to the Stellar network that are actually pretty amazing. And what they, I, without getting too much into the weeds, um, they allow you to manage, uh, they allow one account to cover the Lumen reserves for another account. Um, they also allow a, an anchor to issue a, an asset without an account having a trust line to it. Um, we don't have to get into what either one of those things mean, but what it, too much, but I'll tell you the impact, which is that in the past, if you were building an app on Stellar, um, in order to have an account on the ledger, you had to hold a few limits, right? And in order to hold another asset, you also had to hold a few extra limits in reserve. Um, now, the problem with that, hang on, let me just quit this. Um, the problem with that was that if you're building an app on Stellar and you don't want to tell people that it's a crypto app, you just want them to be able to deposit dollars and treat it just like any other, or whatever fiat currency, and treat it just like any other app, they, you have to somehow get them to get lumens just to cover these reserve requirements. Well, with protocol 15, now the app itself can cover those reserve requirements for a user. And they can do it in a way where user can't harvest the, the, the reserve requirements. So if the user closes their account, the reserve goes back to the app or to the, to the account that, that sponsored the reserve. Um, long way of saying what it means is that now you can very easily build a user facing app on Stellar that does not at all foreground its crypto nature. So you can appeal to people who know nothing about crypto um, but you can still take advantage of all of the sort of interoperability of Stellar. So now I can not only make a payment from Nigerian Naira to Euros, um, but I can do it using an app that doesn't ever tell me it's a crypto app, right? Um, and so the two new features in Protocol 15 are what enable that to happen. So it's, it's, it's definitely going to be a game changer for app building on Stellar. You know, that, that's, that's, and I think to highlight that, if I'm not mistaken, is you don't have to continue to, to put up assets, right? Right. You don't, well, you, it's, or like, it's lumens. For every, yeah. you know, your, your sponsor, you can leverage, you know, leverage your, 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 your main account and not continue to have to, uh, not stake, but yeah, put, put up um, assets and, for, for other types of applications. Right. Well, or accounts. Basically, it, basically, if I have an account, if if you know, if you set up an account on Stellar, and you want to hold a, a U.S. and you don't actually want to touch lumens, like you're you're not interested in crypto, you just want to make payments from USD to euros. Um, the way that Stellar works, there are lumen reserve requirements. You have to have a certain amount of lumens in your account um, in order for it to exist on the ledger, and those are basically just an anti-spam counterweight. They keep the ledger from filling up with accounts that serve no purpose, which is harder on the network. It's harder for people who validate it if the database that keeps track of all the accounts just balloons. So there's just a minimum requirement of lumens, which are the native network currency that you have to hold. With these new uh, changes, like you don't actually have to hold those lumens. I can spot, I can actually just say, I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna oh, nice. hold the lumens to support Adam's account. That's great, um, yeah. And so that way you can just be like, I open an account, I got US dollars, I never touched Lumens. But also it prevents you, uh, not you, but you yeah, know, yeah. Bizarro the Adam, user. The, yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, the evil Adam from, uh, from basically doing some, some bot scraping to farm out. Like if, if I just sent those account, those Lumens to you instead of me holding them in reserve for you, then you could basically close the account and keep them yourself. Yeah. And if you set up a bot to do that, you know, a hundred thousand times, then you're, you can farm those. You can't do that anymore. Right. So now I can sponsor, I can put the lumen, I can basically hold the lumens for you, um, for your account on behalf of your account. Um, so that you, all of your reserve requirements are covered and you never had to think about lumens at all. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. No, I think it streamlines the process. And as you said, it kind of has a network effect really kind of, you know, allow it, it scales. Um, yeah. It allows us to scale. Um, and I know we got a couple, you know, two minutes here to kind of close, finalize our discussion, which has been great. Two great discussions from Justin Rice here. 
Um, what do you see in the next, what are some, uh, what are the, what's on the roadmap for the next six to 12 months, I would say at a high level. Yeah, I think at a high level, we're going to see a lot of work to continue to get more anchors on board. So I think we're going to see more and more currencies and more and more different uh, areas. And then I think we're going to see a lot of work to improve liquidity between pairs. So obviously you can have all these assets on the network, but you want to be able to exchange them really, really easily. And so I think right now there's, there is good liquidity on the Stellar Decentralized Exchange, but as more assets come on, I think you're just going to see more and more liquidity between pairs. So I think that improved liquidity is going to make things even easier. And is, uh, is this through automated market makers or is this traditional order books? I heard you talk about order books on the DEX, uh, which I think, you know, it's interesting. What, what, what kind of mechanism is in play there? Well, Stellar has order books built into to the protocol. So it is okay. almost like a traditional order book. I mean, it's shared, like any interface that touches Stellar uses the same order books. It's just, yeah. um, there is, I think, work that will be done soon to make Stellar friendlier for things like automated market makers. I mean, I think that's an interesting trend. And I think the question is, what, what aspect of it is gonna work and what aspect is gonna last? And I think in yeah. Stellar, we're gonna start to explore those possibilities this year. Nice. Well, we've pretty much lasted here like close close to an hour. Um, thanks for like joining us, Jess. And I heard your previous um, talk and I've heard you, I've listened to you before and like, you're awesome, man. You know, a lot of the stuff, I'm glad that you can share kind of your own, you know, your own insights and your own words on kind of, we just talked about a lot of complicated things, but you made it sound so, so easy. And just at the beginning, I had to like pump the brakes and let people know, you know, the, the swapping of assets is like pretty complicated and, and the payment rails is pretty complicated and you're tackling a uh, however old legacy system in the world of, of existing payment rails from, you know, we're all used to banks um, and then you're kind of, you know, head on like providing an alternative, like a, a superior alternative. And I think it's going to catch on. So, um, you know, Stellar is one of our partners and we're, it's a pleasure, you know, working with you and the team and the Stellar like foundation. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come join us again, to kind of talk about this. And, and I hope, you know, we can pick your brain again uh, for the next couple events. And um, I think, you know, a lot of people learned uh, 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 some, some quality, some quality content from this discussion. That's kind of the game plan for a lot of these talks. Awesome. Well, it was really my pleasure and I, I love what you guys are up to and I, I'm always happy to be here. It's great. Yeah, exactly. And I think this pandemic, right, kind of shed light on, on what, you know, yourself, your team, my team, our investments, why we're in this space. And I think highlighting this content via video is, is critical. And I think, you know, people couldn't go to all these conferences, right? They're super expensive. You got to travel. You got to, you know, they're, they're, they're long days. People have jobs. And, you know, our motivation here is to deliver what, you know, what I was able to experience on that conference circuit um, into a discussion like this, which I think it's valuable. And, and what's important is you don't have to miss a lot of our, our interviews, you know, like, I missed a lot of interviews because I wanted to see this panel. I wanted to, you know, talk to these people. Um, maybe the networking obviously doesn't work out, but I think the content, the education, like what we're talking about is more important. Um, and obviously I used to network all the time, but you know, um, what, what you're providing to our audience is, is valuable and it's important. And so again, I thank you for joining. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, man. We'll talk soon. Uh, for yeah. all of you tuning in to Reimagine 2020, this is Justin, uh, Justin Rice here, head of ecosystem with the Stellar development foundation um and it's been a real pleasure uh, hopefully you learned a lot and uh, we'll, we'll uh, catch you on the next interview so uh, thank you justin have a good one thanks see you later all right